Okay, now we're back to the Song of Songs, where it's all about the month of Elul and returning to God as our king. We were in Acts 4, which is chapter 5, verse 3, through chapter 6, verse 10, where the bride finally experiences true repentance. She has a heartfelt church, a uh, search. And look at Song of Songs 6.1. If you remember last week, she was imploring the daughters of Jerusalem to help them find her beloved. And then they say, why in the world should we help you look for them? And then she goes through how fantastic and how phenomenal the, uh, he is. <clears throat> and then they say here, where is your beloved gone? O thou fairest among women, where is your beloved turned aside? Because we want to seek him with you. And I was telling you last week, that's how we need to present the Lord. We need to present him in a way that people say, wow, I, well, let me find him. The, the most problem with evangelism, it's all hellfire and brimstone, you know, or legalism, or uh, it's, they look at your life and wondering, what in the world is he going to do for me? So uh, we need to realize how we present the Lord is one of the most important things. And so... Look how she responds when they also want to look for the shepherd in verse 2 and 3. Now, this is uh, so important. She says, my beloved has gone into his garden. Okay, it's not my garden anymore. It's his garden to the beds of spices, <clears throat> and then she says, it's to feed his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. Okay, I've got a bunch of lilies here. Now, if you remember, lilies speak of people, all right? As you know, we can be referred to as sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. Okay, we're compared to sheep. We can be compared to goats. We can uh, be compared to lilies. All right, so God uses all kinds of metaphors. And in here, it refers to souls. He's gathering lilies. And so what do we see? Now look at this. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock, where? Among the lilies. Uh, there's so much that's in these verses here. Uh, like I said, it's no longer my garden. It's now his garden. But what you're going to see here is the Shulamite is maturing in her relationship. How I many of you know it's all about relationship? Okay. She's maturing in her relationship with the shepherd. Uh, we realize, or she realizes it's his garden. It's his flock. And so throughout scriptures, God's people are related to as all kinds of things. Remember bringing in the sheaves? Look at Psalm 126.6. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And we know uh, even from Joseph's dream, the sheaves refer to people. Now, do you remember in chapter 2, verse 16, she goes, my beloved is mine, and I am his. But now, it's turned around. It's I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. So her claim on him now comes second. It's not he belongs to me first, and then I'm his. But no, now I'm his, and he is mine. Well, you're going to find it changes again as she matures even more. When it talks about the fullness of the Gentiles, many Christians think that means the last one billionth Gentile or something like that. No, the fullness of the Gentiles means the maturity of the Gentiles. You don't reap a crop until it's mature. And so God is waiting for the church to grow up. That's what he's waiting for. Now, let's see. Now look at how the shepherd responds. In chapter 6, verse 4 through 9, let me, I want to make sure I'm not...
skipping anything. Okay, he says, oh my love, you are as beautiful as what? Okay, who's ever heard of Terza? Okay, well, I'm going to explain Terza here in just a minute when he says you are as beautiful as Terza. Then he says, as lovely as Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then look at this. Awesome as an army with banners. That's what she says. She alone is like an army with banners. They used to always have banners, the military did. People would see the banners and the the word means to be conspicuous. You want everybody to see, which is why when the Lord comes, he's going to have all of the tribes of Israel with them, and they all are going to have their banners as they come. And then the shepherd says to her, oh, turn your eyes away from me. They've overcome me. Now he describes her again. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing, everyone bearing twins. None is barren among them. Like a piece of pomegranate are your temples behind your veils. Okay, now watch this. He says to her, now do you remember there's Jerusalem and then there's the daughters of Jerusalem. Who does Solomon love? The daughters of Jerusalem. He doesn't care about Jerusalem. Look what this says. The shepherd is saying to his bride, look, there's 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number, my dove, my perfect one. You are the only one. You are the only one of her mother. So he's not consumed with all the daughters of Jerusalem. He loves Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting. The only one of her mother. That is very significant. And I'll show you why here in a minute. Then the favorite of the one who bore her. Do you remember when God told Abraham to offer up Isaac? <clears throat> he said, offer up your son. Goes, Which one? Your only son. Which one? <laughs> you know, the one you love. Oh, that one. <laughs> well, that's kind of what is going on here as well. And then it says, <clears throat> the daughter saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Well, we have to realize there's a heavenly Jerusalem as well as an earthly Jerusalem. And in one sense, uh, God is speaking of two armies. He has his earthly army and he has his heavenly army. And so just like people are born on earth, there are people who are born again. And the ones who are born again, their birth is heaven. Do you follow me? There's a earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem that's coming down. And when it comes down, there are all of those who were born there are the ones who are going to live there because they've been born again. Look at Psalm 87, 5 and 6. And of Zion, it will be said, well, this and that person was born in her and the highest himself will establish her. The Lord will count when he writes up the people this is the one who was born there. That's referring to those who are born again, the who are born from above. Now, who was Terza? Look at this. Back in the Torah, Numbers 27, 1 through 5, here comes the daughters of Zelophehad and the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, Machar, the son of Manasseh, families of Manasseh, son of Joseph. And look at the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and oh, so she was one of those daughters that said, hey, my dad doesn't have a son. Can't we have the land, right? So she was one of those daughters that fought for the land of Israel. That's what she wanted. Now, it's interesting. The tribe of Manasseh, they were on the one side of Jordan and the other side of Jordan. Their tribes were split. And they want to make sure they have their side in the promised land, not on the other side of Jordan. And it says they stood before Moses and Eliezer, the priest, and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, look, our father died in the wilderness. He wasn't in the company of those that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah. 
Yeah, he may have died in his own sin and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he doesn't have a son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses said, well, let me go check it out. Let me see what the Lord says. Terza, her name means delightful. That's what Terza means. There was actually a city that was named after her that was just north of Shechem or Shechem in the promised land. Okay, we see that she, that their dad was the offspring of Manasseh, and uh, they go to find out what's going to happen. But look at 1 Kings 15, 33. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahia, to reign over all of Israel, where? Terza's where all the kings of Israel reigned. So Terza's huge. And here he reigned 24 years. So Terza was the capital of the northern tribes. This is where all the kings reigned. Now, like I said, I can't help but think of all the wives that Solomon had. As I read the phrase, there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. And then I think it's exciting that the shepherd says, you are the one and the only one for me. Solomon was never satisfied. But what do we read concerning the Lord in Jerusalem in Psalm 137, 5 and 6? It says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my what? Chief joy. Solomon is not happy with Jerusalem. She's not her chief, his chief joy. His chief joy is in all the daughters of Jerusalem. I also find it interesting, as I mentioned, that she's called the only one of her mother. We saw Terza had all kinds of sisters. There's a whole bunch of sisters. He's talking about Terza, and then he goes and says the only one of her mother. Well, we also, like I said, remember what the Lord said to Abraham concerning Isaac. Uh, we see it in Genesis 22, 2, when he said, take now your son. And he's saying, well, I got two sons. And he says, your only son. Oh, well, I, I still only have two sons. The one you love, even Isaac. Well, in Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 10, look at this. She looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. And I think it's interesting. It mentions an army with banners and it mentions the moon and the sun. Okay. Which is, you know, I keep thinking also in terms of eclipses when they're happening, but look at this. This is another thing that is totally amazing. Now, here we see the Shulamite, the bride, is described as an army with her flags flying high for all the world to see with clarity. There's no longer any doubt on her part as to her identity or her relationship with the shepherd. And uh, we'll be talking more about the warrior bride later. But that word uh, means dagal, which means to flaunt, to raise a flag, to be conspicuous. So, like Esther, she didn't want to be conspicuous. She wanted to hide her identity. Well, there's a time coming when the church, the bride, believers aren't going to be afraid to show they're a believer. They're going to be flying the flag of God without fear. They're going to be part of the army, and they're going to be conspicuous. A lot of times during the tribulation, you think, oh, everybody's going to be afraid hiding behind a rock. No, we need to flaunt the flag. As a matter of fact, if we realize this, what the Song of Songs is saying is the bride is now sanctified. She's become a mighty warrior. She's now ready for battle. She's rejoicing in her shepherd king. Look at Isaiah. It speaks about this day. It says the burden against Babylon. Now, think when you think of Babylon, also think of the book of Revelation and mystery Babylon. He says, lift up a banner on the highest mountain. So here you're on a high mountain lifting up a banner. Everyone's going to see it. 
And then it says, raise your voice to them and wave your hand like, yee I'm over here trying to come and get me. We're not to be afraid. And it says that they may enter the gates of the nobles. He says, I have commanded my sanctified ones. I've also called my mighty ones. Why? For my anger, <clears throat> those who rejoice in my exaltation. Here's the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like that of many people, a tumultuous noise of kingdoms of nations all gathering together. And the Lord of hosts musters the army for battle. So God is mustering the army for battle. Are we going to be deserters? Or are we going to be afraid of the giants? Or are we going to join the battle? They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. The Lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. Well, here it is. The day of the Lord is at hand. That's the tribulation. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold, sorrows will take hold of them. They'll be in pain as a woman in childbirth. How many of you know from Matthew 24 and everywhere, this is what is talking about the day of the Lord here. And it says they will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. But now look at the next verses. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He's going to destroy the sinners out of it. And then look at here, we have the sun, the moon, and the stars of Genesis 1.14 all involved. The stars of heaven and the constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and is going forth. The moon will not cause her light to shine. I will punish the world for their evil, the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Well, if you remember in Joseph's dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars representing Jacob, Israel, okay? And the 12 stars, okay? The moon. So all of this represented the nation of Israel, but also all the believers. Look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Here we find the earth was without form, void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moves on the face of the waters and God said, let there be light, and there was light. There's so much in these verses people don't realize. It says, God said, let there be light. Many believe he didn't say, let there be light. He sang, let there be light. Okay, I mean, I, can you imagine the power of God singing, let there be light. I mean, God is, how, wow, the voice of the Lord is powerful. And so that's one thing I want to point out. I believe at creation, he sang it. Wouldn't that just be mind-blowing? But here's the other thing. The Hebrew word for to speak or to say is uh, more, aleph, Mem Rish, Amor. Now, get a load of this. Um, let me see. And, and as I mentioned, Israel was compared to the sun, the moon, and the stars because they were foreordained to be the light to the world. That's why they're compared to that. In Genesis uh, 15, 5, it says, and he brought Abraham abroad and said, look now, toward heaven and do what? Count the stars. If you're able to number them, and he said, so shall your seed be. So all of Abraham's faithful descendants were all to be as signs. The stars were to be signs. And if we're to be as, that in heavens as signs, it says, so shall your seed be. His seed is supposed to be light in the darkness. We're to be the light in the dark world. Now, I always thought this was fascinating. This is Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. Those that are wise will shine as the brightness of the firmament. 
those that turn many to righteousness will be as the stars forever and ever. But you, O Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book, even to the time of the end, and many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Now, if you know anything about astronomy, there's real bright stars and there's dim stars. Some of them are because they're further away. Some of them is because they are so much bigger than the other ones. But I take this literally as well. Each one of you, as a believer, are going to be a, like a star. You're going to have brightness, but depending on... Every one of us will be a different size star. We will all have different magnitude. Okay, so we have to understand that God is not a socialist. God is not a communist. It, it, everybody doesn't get an A just for appearing. Okay, and so we have to realize, what magnification do you want to be? Do you want to be a, I mean, you're all going to be a star, you're all going to glow. But at what magnification do you want to be? What size? The bigger you are, the more glory goes to God. It's not for you. Again, when you think about, I want to be a big star, it's not for you. How much do you want God to be magnified? That's the question. It's not how big do you want to be. It's how much glory do you want to give to God? really turns things around. And look at Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. Arise and shine for your light has come. It's the glory of the Lord that's risen upon you. That, he's the light. Darkness will cover the earth. Gross darkness the people. One of these darkness means moral darkness. Okay, you got to think of that as well. And then it says, but... The Lord is going to rise on you. His glory, and it's not your glory, it's his glory that's going to be seen on you. He's speaking to Israel. And he says, the Gentiles are going to come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising, just like the rising of the sun. So Jacob or Israel, if you remember, is the sun. Rachel was the moon and Joseph and his brothers were the stars. Israel is going to be coming such a huge, bright star that everyone's going to recognize. Now, here's something else that I always thought was interesting. In Genesis 15, 12 through 16, the sun is going down. A deep sleep falls on Abram, and a horror of great darkness falls upon him. And the Lord says to Abram, do you, you need to know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that isn't theirs and shall serve them and afflict them 400 years. And that nation whom they serve, I will judge. Then they'll come out with great substance and you shall go to your fathers in peace and will be buried in a good old age. And then it says in the fourth generation, you will come here again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet. So what do we see? Redemption comes when the iniquity of the Amorites is full. When does redemption come? When the iniquity of the Amorites is full. What does the Hebrew word Amorite mean? No, no, no. Now, you, we have uh, um, Hamas is violence, okay, and the Hittites are the terrorists, and Amalek is the people who chop up bodies. But the Amorites, God was waiting for the iniquity of the Amorites to come to the full. Do you know it is now that the iniquity of the Amorites has come to the full and redemption is about to take place? Who do who does represent the Amorite today? You have to know what the word Amorite means. The Amorite actually is spelled Amor with a U. And Amor means to speak. The Amorites are the fake news. It's the publicists. It's the press. And the iniquity of the press is, 
at the fullest it's ever been with all the fake news. Isn't that mind blowing? He's talking about those who speak the publicist to be prominent. Evil speech, those who always are doing evil speech. Evil speech is at its highest point today. Look at all the evil speech among the religions, the politicians, the everything. And so when the iniquity of the press has come to the full, redemption is nigh. Isn't that fascinating? Now, speaking of the Song of Songs and lifting up the banner, and there's armies, it has to do with armies, and even mentions, I think next week we'll talk about two armies, just like, remember when Jacob, when he called uh, the place that means two armies? Okay, Manahaim, here you have God's army in heaven, and Israel was God's army on earth. Well, look at Numbers 10, 13, and 14. Here, they're taking their very first journey after being a year around Mount Sinai. They got a year off. That probably was the Shemitah year. I'd have to look. But what do we see? They're going according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And you have to realize they're going to battle. They're going with Joshua to take the promised land. And it says, in the first place of the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, set forward according to their army, and over his army was not shown the son of Amminadab. So what tribe marched first? And who was the head of it? Not shown. And why was not shown the head of it? He was the first one to jump into the Red Sea that caused it to divide. That's why he got to go first. Now, again, they are entering the promised land in the order of how they journeyed. And so what do we see now? Let's see. In Numbers 10, when they go to March, when we go to verse 35 and 36, Whenever they set out, this is what Moses said. And they're just now setting out as their armies to take the promised land. Moses would say, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, he said, return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Did you know there is something very weird about this verse? in the Bible, in Hebrew, that you don't see in English. Does anyone remember? It's surrounded by two dead fish. There are two dead fish. Now, the Hebrew letter for fish is the letter noon. And the letter noon, just like we put parentheses around something, these are like brackets, okay? But the letter noon are backwards and upside down. And the sages have always wondered why in the world this verse is separated from all the rest of the Torah. As a matter of fact, they thought that should be the six books of the Torah, just that one verse. Well, what is amazing, what believers in Yeshua have come to realize, when it says, rise up, O Lord, that refers to his resurrection 2,000 years ago. And upon his return, it represents the resurrection of the dead when all of us also rise. Now, look at this. Here I have a compass. We have north, south, west, and east. And I want to point out to you, think of Moses' tabernacle in the middle there. East went first when they're going to war, then south, then west, and then north. They all, you know, going around the clock or the compass. Now, who went first on the east? Exactly. It was Judah. Now, on the south, you have three tribes on the east. 
you have three tribes on the south, three on the west, three on the north, that equals 12 tribes, okay? Now, who was in charge of the south? Judah was in charge, but Issachar and Zebulun are also over there. Okay, who was in charge of the south? What tribe? Reuben, exactly. Now, Reuben had a tribe on either side of them. And what I want you to realize, the three tribes here and here all were Leah's kids. Rachel's kids were west and north. All right? Now, you have Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Zilpah. Okay, her kids are over here. And the last one on the south is Gad. All right? Then, so I want you to think of Leah. The baton that's being passed is going all the way around and then ends up with Gad. Gad then gives it to the head over here. Now, who was that? Who was the head on the west? Ephraim. All right. And then Benjamin and Manasseh were also over there. But so then it goes from Gad, Judah, the baton is passing around every tribe to Gad, and then Gad hands it off to Ephraim. And then all the tribes follow until it ends up with Naphtali. Okay, so I want you to think as the sun, as Rachel and Leah, the moons, as Bilhah and Zilpah, her two handmaids. Everyone following me? So the baton passes to, from Leah's side to Rachel's side, over to the last one on Rachel's side, and then back to Judah. Now, this is how they march to war. You following me? Judah would go first. Zebulun, Issachar, come down here. You'd have Reuben, all right? Then you'd have Simeon, and then you'd have Gad. And then they'd go from Ephraim to Benjamin and Manasseh, okay? And, and then it would go to the north. Who was in charge of the north? Dan. Dan. Okay, here's what is so mind-blowing. I hope this helped people get this. The eclipses that are coming are right here. <clears throat> A solar eclipse always for the last, since creation, has always followed a lunar eclipse by two weeks. You see, March 14th, March 29th, September 7th, September 21st, you know, September 18th, October 2nd. We just had the lunar eclipse on September 18th. Rosh Hashanah is October 2nd. What I want you to notice here, let me do this. Okay, Judah went first, right? And that is the solar eclipse, the big solar eclipse that went across the United States. Now, solar eclipses refer to the nations, lunar eclipses to Israel. And that was followed by this last September 18th, a lunar eclipse. And it went from Judah to Gad. And then we find Tishri 1, Ephraim in the west, and it ends up with Naphtali in the north. The eclipses are happening in the same order as how they march to war to take the promised land. And it happens two years in a row. And they're happening on Nisan 1, Tishri 1, Elul 15, and Purim, Adar 15. Purim is all about Amalek wanting to destroy Israel. These, this is why I wrote my book, America at War 24 through 26, because I understand God said in Genesis 1.14, the sun and the moon are signs on the appointed times. 
which is Nissan 1, Tishri 1, a low 50, and a dar 50. And here these are plainly put in order of how it's going to appear over the next two years. This is why we have to understand, like the Song of Songs talks about, an army with banners, clear as the sun, fair as the moon. This is telling us this is why war is going to be coming big time over these next two years. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we're at Act 5, which begins chapter 6, verse 11 through 8, 4. And here the bride finally works the harvest. This time she falls asleep, not because of lethargy, but because she's been working so hard. And so look what we find in the Song of Songs, chapter 6, 11 and 12. What does the bride say? I went down into the garden. Wow. Remember, she's always been in bed, doesn't want to go out. Here she voluntarily goes down into the garden of nuts. That's California. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished. In the second chapter, Messiah says we got to take care of the vine. The foxes are spoiling the vine, which refers to the false prophets we saw. And she could care less. But now she's going to see if the vine is flourishing, whether the pomegranates budded. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. She's running, just like uh, Abraham. He would always run. To everything he did, he would run. His heart was in it. And so how do the daughters of Jerusalem respond when she, they see her on the run for her beloved? They go, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. And that speaks of the month of Belul. And look at this. How does she respond? What in the world are you going to see in me? So now she's humble. It's not about her. She says, why do you want to look at me? And look how they respond. What do I see? I see the company of what? Two armies. It's the heavenly army and the earthly har army. They, they finally see it. And look at Genesis 32, 1 and 2. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's army. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which means two camps, two armies. So here he had his army on earth and the army of heaven was around him. And then look at 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 13 and 15. The Philistines yet again spread themselves abroad in the valley. Therefore, David inquired again of God and God said to him, don't go up after them. Turn away from them. Come upon them against the mulberry trees. And it will be when you hear a sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall go out to battle for God has gone forth before you to smite the host of the Philistines. There are two armies, and we have to go when God says go. The spies decided to go the following day, and Moses says, don't go. He's not with you. But they also did the opposite of what God said then. We have to be in shape. We have to be ready to go to war. We can't be afraid like the 10 spies. But we have to understand this war, spiritual, physical, go hand in hand, and that's what we're entering. All right? But don't be afraid. With that, let's stand. Uh.